recording by Roger Moline. The Jewel of Seven Stars by Bram Stoker. Chapter Nineteen: The Great Experiment. If any evidence had been wanted of how absolutely one and all of us had come to believe in the spiritual existence of the Egyptian queen, it would have been found in the change which in a few minutes had been effected in us by the statement of voluntary negation made, we all believed, through Margaret. Despite the coming of the fearful ordeal, the sense of which it was impossible to forget, we looked and acted as though a great relief had come to us. We had indeed lived in such a state of terrorism during the days when Mr. Trelawney was lying in a trance that the feeling had bitten deeply into us. No one knows till he has experienced it what it is to be in constant dread of some unknown danger which may come at any time and in any form. The change was manifested in different ways, according to each nature. Margaret was sad. Dr. Winchester was in high spirits and keenly observant, the process of thought which had served as an antidote to fear being now relieved from this duty added to his intellectual enthusiasm. Mr. Corbeck seemed to be in a retrospective rather than a speculative mood. I was myself rather inclined to be gay. The relief from certain anxiety regarding Margaret was sufficient for me for the time. As to Mr. Trelawney, he seemed less changed than any. Perhaps this was only natural, as he had had in his mind the intention for so many years of doing that in which we were tonight engaged, that any event connected with it could only seem to him as an episode a step to the end. His was that commanding nature which looks so to the end of an undertaking that all else is of secondary importance. Even now, though his terrible sternness relaxed under the relief from the strain, he never flagged nor faltered for a moment in his purpose. He asked us men to come with him, and going to the hall, we presently managed to lower into the cave an oak table, fairly long and not too wide, which stood against the wall in the hall. This we placed under the strong cluster of electric lights in the middle of the cave. Margaret looked on for a while, then all at once her face blanched, and in an agitated voice she said, "'What are you going to do, father?' to unroll the mummy of the cat. Queen Terra will not need her familiar tonight. If she should want him, it might be dangerous to us, so we shall make him safe. You are not alarmed, dear? Oh, no, she answered quickly. But I was thinking of my Silvio, and how I should feel if he had been the mummy that was to be unswathed. Mr. Trelawney got knives and scissors ready, and placed the cat on the table. It was a grim beginning to our work, and it made my heart sink when I thought of what might happen in that lonely house in the mid-gloom of the night. The sense of loneliness and isolation from the world was increased by the moaning of the wind which had now risen ominously, and by the beating of waves on the rocks below. But we had too grave a task before us to be swayed by external manifestations. The unrolling of the mummy began. There was an incredible number of bandages, and the tearing sound, they being stuck fast to each other by bitumen and gums and spices, and the little cloud of red pungent dust that arose, pressed on the senses of all of us. As the last wrappings came away, we saw the animal seated before us. He was all hunkered up, his hair and teeth and claws were complete. The eyes were closed, but the eyelids had not the fierce look which I expected. The whiskers had been pressed down on the side of the face by the bandaging, but when the pressure was taken away they stood out, just as they would have done in life. He was a magnificent creature, 
a tiger-cat of great size. But as we looked at him, our first glance of admiration changed to one of fear, and a shudder ran through each one of us, for here was a confirmation of the fears which we had endured. His mouth and his claws were smeared with the dry red stains of recent blood. Dr. Winchester was the first to recover. Blood in itself had small disturbing quality for him. He had taken out his magnifying glass and was examining the stains on the cat's mouth. Mr. Trelawney breathed loudly as though a strain had been taken from him. "'It is as I expected,' he said. "'This promises well for what is to follow.' By this time Dr. Winchester was looking at the red-stained paws. "'As I expected,' he said. "'He has seven claws, too.' Opening his pocket-book, he took out the piece of blotting-paper marked by Silvio's claws, on which was also marked in pencil a diagram of the cuts made on Mr. Trelawney's wrist. He placed the paper under the mummy-cat's paw. The marks fitted exactly. When we had carefully examined the cat, finding, however, nothing strange about it but its wonderful preservation, Mr. Trelawney lifted it from the table. Margaret started forward, crying out, "'Take care, father! Take care! He may injure you!' "'Not now, my dear,' he answered as he moved towards the stairway. Her face fell. "'Where are you going?' she asked in a faint voice. "'To the kitchen,' he answered. "'Fire will take away all danger for the future. Even an astral body cannot materialize from ashes.' He signed to us to follow him. Margaret turned away with a sob. I went to her, but she motioned me back and whispered, "'No, no. Go with the others.' Father may want you. Oh, it seems like murder. The poor queen's pet. The tears were dropping from under the fingers that covered her eyes. In the kitchen was a fire of wood ready laid. To this Mr. Trelawney applied a match. In a few seconds the kindling had caught and the flames leaped. When the fire was solidly ablaze, he threw the body of the cat into it. For a few seconds it lay a dark mass amidst the flames, and the room was rank with the smell of burning hair. Then the dry body caught fire, too. The inflammable substances used in embalming became new fuel, and the flames roared. A few minutes of fierce conflagration and then we breathed freely. Queen Terra's familiar was no more. When we went back to the cave, we found Margaret sitting in the dark. She had switched off the electric light, and only a faint glow of the evening light came through the narrow openings. Her father went quickly over to her and put his arms around her in a loving, protective way. She laid her head in his shoulder for a minute and seemed comforted. Presently she called to me. "'Malcolm, turn up the light!' I carried out her orders and could see that, though she had been crying, her eyes were now dry. Her father saw it, too, and looked glad. He said to us in a grave tone, "'Now we had better prepare for our great work. It will not do to leave anything to the last. Margaret must have had a suspicion of what was coming, for it was with a sinking voice that she asked, "'What are you going to do now?' Mr. Trelawney, too, must have had a suspicion of her feelings, for he answered in a low tone, "'To unroll the mummy of Queen Terra." She came close to him and said pleadingly in a whisper, "'Father, you are not going to unswathe her. "'All you men—' "'And in the glare of light? 
"'But why not, my dear?' "'Just think, father, a woman, all alone, in such a way, in such a place. Oh, it's cruel, cruel!' She was manifestly much overcome. Her cheeks were flaming red, and her eyes were full of indignant tears. Her father saw her distress, and, sympathizing with it, began to comfort her. I was moving off, but he signed to me to stay. I took it that, after the usual manner of men, he wanted help on such an occasion, and manlike wished to throw on someone else the task of dealing with a woman in indignant distress. However, he began to appeal first to her reason. "'Not a woman, dear, a mummy. She has been dead nearly five thousand years.' "'What does that matter? Sex is not a matter of years. A woman is a woman, if she had been dead five thousand centuries. And you expect her to arise out of that long sleep? It could not be real death if she is to rise out of it. You have led me to believe that she will come alive when the coffer is opened.' "'I did, my dear, and I believe it. But if it isn't death that has been the matter with her all these years, it is something uncommonly like it. Then again, just think, it was men who embalmed her. They didn't have women's rights or lady doctors in ancient Egypt, my dear. And besides, he went on more freely, seeing that she was accepting his argument, if not yielding to it, we men are accustomed to such things. Corbeck and I have unrolled a hundred mummies, and there were as many women as men amongst them. Dr. Winchester, in his work, has had to deal with women as well as men, till custom has made him think nothing of sex. Even Ross has in his work as a barrister... He stopped suddenly. "'You were going to help, too?' she said to me with an indignant look. I said nothing. I thought silence was best. Mr. Trelawney went on hurriedly. I could see that he was glad of interruption, for the part of his argument concerning a barrister's work was becoming decidedly weak. "'My child, you will be with us yourself. Would we do anything which would hurt or offend you? Come now, be reasonable. We are not at a pleasure party. We are all grave men.' entering gravely on an experiment which may unfold the wisdom of old times and enlarge human knowledge indefinitely, which may put the minds of men on new tracks of thought and research. An experiment, as he went on, his voice deepened, which may be fraught with death to any one of us, to us all. We know from what has been that there are, or may be, vast and unknown dangers ahead of us, of which none in this house today may ever see the end. Take it, my child, that we are not acting lightly, but with all the gravity of deeply earnest men. Besides, my dear, whatever feelings you or any of us may have on the subject, it is necessary for the success of the experiment to unswathe her. I think that under any circumstances it would be necessary to remove the wrappings before she became again a live human being instead of a spiritualized corpse with an astral body. Were her original intentions carried out, and did she come to new life within her mummy wrappings, it might be to exchange a coffin for a grave. She would die the death of the buried alive. But now, when she is voluntarily abandoned for the time her astral power, there can be no doubt on the subject. Margaret's face cleared. All right, father, she said as she kissed him. But, oh, it seems a horrible indignity to a queen and a woman. I was moving away to the staircase when she called me. Where are you going? I came back and took her hand and stroked it as I answered, 
I shall come back when the unrolling is over. She looked at me long, and a faint suggestion of a smile came over her face as she said, Perhaps you had better stay, too. It may be useful to you in your work as a barrister. She smiled out as she met my eyes, but in an instant she changed. Her face grew grave and deadly white. In a faraway voice she said, Father is right. It is a terrible occasion. We need all to be serious over it. But all the same, nay, for that very reason, you had better stay, Malcolm. You may be glad, later on, that you were present tonight. My heart sank down, down at her words, but I thought it better to say nothing. Fear was stalking openly enough amongst us already. By this time Mr. Trelawney, assisted by Mr. Corbeck and Dr. Winchester, had raised the lid of the ironstone sarcophagus which contained the mummy of the queen. It was a large one, but it was none too big. The mummy was both long and broad and high, and was of such weight that it was no easy task, even for the four of us, to lift it out. Under Mr. Trelawney's direction we laid it out on the table prepared for it. Then, and then only, did the full horror of the whole thing burst upon me. There, in the full glare of the light, the whole material and sordid side of death seemed staringly real. The outer wrappings, torn and loosened by rude touch, and with the color either darkened by dust or worn light by friction, seemed creased as by rough treatment. The jagged edges of the wrapping cloths looked fringed. The painting was patchy, and the varnish chipped. The coverings were evidently many, for the bulk was great. But through all showed that unhideable human figure, which seems to look more horrible when partially concealed than at any other time. What was before us was death, and nothing else. All the romance and sentiment of fancy had disappeared. The two elder men, enthusiasts who had often done such work, were not disconcerted, and Dr. Winchester seemed to hold himself in a business-like attitude as if before the operating table. But I felt low-spirited and miserable and ashamed, and besides I was pained and alarmed by Margaret's ghastly pallor. Then the work began. The unrolling of the mummy cat had prepared me somewhat for it, but this was so much larger and so infinitely more elaborate that it seemed a different thing. Moreover, in addition to the ever-present sense of death and humanity, there was a feeling of something finer in all this. The cat had been embalmed with coarser materials. Here, all, when once the outer coverings were removed, was more delicately done. It seemed as if only the finest gums and spices had been used in this embalming. But there were the same surroundings, the same attendant red dust and pungent presence of bitumen, there was the same sound of rending which marked the tearing away of the bandages. There were an enormous number of these, and their bulk, when opened, was great. As the men unrolled them, I grew more and more excited. I did not take a part in it myself. Margaret had looked at me gratefully as I drew back. We clasped hands and held each other hard. As the unrolling went on, the wrappings became finer, and the smell less laden with bitumen, but more pungent. We all, I think, began to feel it as though it caught or touched us in some special way. This, however, did not interfere with the work. It went on uninterruptedly. Some of the inner wrappings bore symbols or pictures. These were done sometimes wholly in pale green color, sometimes in many colors, 
but always with a prevalence of green. Now and again Mr. Trelawney or Mr. Corbeck would point out some special drawing before laying the bandage on the pile behind them, which kept growing to a monstrous height. At last we knew that the wrappings were coming to an end. Already the proportions were reduced to those of a normal figure of the manifest height of the queen, who was more than average height. And as the end drew nearer, so Margaret's pallor grew, and her heart beat more and more wildly till her breast heaved in a way that frightened me. Just as her father was taking away the last of the bandages, he happened to look up and caught the pained and anxious look of her pale face. He paused, and taking her concern to be as to the outrage on modesty, said in a comforting way, "'Do not be uneasy, dear. See, there is nothing to harm you. The queen has on a robe. Ay, and a royal robe, too.' The wrapping was a wide piece the whole length of the body. It being removed, a profusely full robe of white linen had appeared, covering the body from the throat to the feet. And such linen! We all bent over to look at it. Margaret lost her concern in her woman's interest in fine stuff. Then the rest of us looked with admiration for surely such linen was never seen by the eyes of our age. It was as fine as the finest silk. But never was spun or woven silk which lay in such gracious folds, constrict though they were by the close wrappings of the mummy cloth, and fixed into hardness by the passing of thousands of years. Round the neck it was delicately embroidered in pure gold with tiny sprays of sycamore, and round the feet, similarly worked, was an endless line of lotus plants of unequal height and with all the graceful abandon of natural growth. Across the body, but manifestly not surrounding it, was a girdle of jewels a wondrous girdle which shone and glowed with all the forms and faces and colors of the sky. The buckle was a great yellow stone, round of outline, deep and curved, as if a yielding globe had been pressed down. It shone and glowed as though a veritable sun lay within. The rays of its light seemed to strike out and illumine all around. Flanking it were two great moonstones of lesser size, whose glowing, beside the glory of the sunstone, was like the silvery sheen of moonlight. And then, on either side, linked by golden clasps of exquisite shape, was a line of flaming jewels, of which the colors seemed to glow. Each of these stones seemed to hold a living star, which twinkled in every phase of changing light. Margaret raised her hands in ecstasy. She bent over to examine more closely, but suddenly drew back and stood fully erect at her grand height. She seemed to speak with a conviction of absolute knowledge as she said, That is no searment. It was not meant for the clothing of death. It is a marriage robe. Mr. Trelawney leaned over and touched the linen robe. He lifted a fold at the neck, and I knew from the quick intake of his breath that something had surprised him. He lifted yet a little more, and then he too stood back and pointed, saying, Margaret is right. That dress is not intended to be worn by the dead. See, her figure is not robed in it. It is but laid upon her. He lifted the zone of jewels and handed it to Margaret. Then with both hands he raised the ample robe and laid it across the arms which she extended in a natural impulse. 
things of such beauty were too precious to be handled with any but the greatest care. We all stood awed at the beauty of the figure which, save for the face cloth, now lay completely nude before us. Mr. Trelawney bent over, and with hands that trembled slightly, raised this linen cloth which was of the same fineness as the robe. As he stood back and the whole glorious beauty of the queen was revealed, I felt a rush of shame sweep over me. It was not right that we should be there, gazing with irreverent eyes on such unclad beauty. It was indecent. It was almost sacrilegious. And yet the white wonder of that beautiful form was something to dream of. It was not like death at all. It was like a statue carven in ivory by the hand of Praxiteles. There was nothing of that horrible shrinkage which death seems to affect in a moment. There was none of the wrinkled toughness which seems to be a leading characteristic of most mummies. There was not the shrunken attenuation of a body dried in the sand, as I had seen before in museums. All the pores of the body seemed to have been preserved in some wonderful way. The flesh was full and round, as in a living person, and the skin was as smooth as satin. The color seemed extraordinary. It was like ivory, new ivory, except with a right arm, with shattered, blood-stained wrist, and missing hand had lain bare to exposure in the sarcophagus for so many tens of centuries. With a womanly impulse, with a mouth that drooped with pity, with eyes that flashed with anger, and cheeks that flamed, Margaret threw over the body the beautiful robe which lay across her arm. Only the face was then to be seen. This was more startling even than the body, for it seemed not dead, but alive. The eyelids were closed, but the long, black, curling lashes lay over on the cheeks. The nostrils, set in grave pride, seemed to have the repose which, when it is seen in life, is greater than the repose of death. The full red lips, though the mouth was not open, showed the tiniest white line of pearly teeth within. Her hair, glorious in quantity and glossy black as the raven's wing, was piled in great masses over the white forehead, on which a few curling tresses strayed like tendrils. I was amazed at the likeness to Margaret, though I had had my mind prepared for this by Mr. Corbeck's quotation of her father's statement. This woman, I could not think of her as a mummy or a corpse, was the image of Margaret as my eyes had first lit on her. The likeness was increased by the jeweled ornament which she wore in her hair, the disc and plumes, such as Margaret, too, had worn. It, too, was a glorious jewel, one noble pearl of moonlight luster, flanked by carven pieces of moonstone. Mr. Trelawney was overcome as he looked. He quite broke down, and when Margaret flew to him and held him close in her arms and comforted him, I heard him murmur brokenly, "'It looks as if you were dead, my child.' There was a long silence. I could hear without the roar of the wind, which was now risen to a tempest, and the furious dashing of the waves far below. Mr. Trelawney's voice broke the spell. Later on we must try and find out the process of embalming. It is not like any that I know. There does not seem to have been any opening cut for the withdrawing of the viscera and organs, which apparently remain intact within the body. Then again there is no moisture in the flesh, but its place is supplied with something else, as though wax or stearin had been conveyed into the veins by some subtle process. 
I wonder, could it be possible that at that time they could have used paraffin? It might have been, by some process that we know not, pumped into the veins where it hardened. Margaret, having thrown a white sheet over the queen's body, asked us to bring it to her own room, where we laid it on her bed. Then she sent us away, saying, "'Leave her alone with me. There are still many hours to pass, and I do not like to leave her lying there, all stark in the glare of light. This may be the bridal she prepared for, the bridal of death, and at least she shall wear her pretty robes. When presently she brought me back to her room, the dead queen was dressed in the robe of fine linen with the embroidery of gold, and all her beautiful jewels were in place. Candles were lit around her, and white flowers lay upon her breast. Hand in hand we stood looking at her for a while. Then, with a sigh, Margaret covered her with one of her own snowy sheets. She turned away, and after softly closing the door of the room, went back with me to the others who had now come into the dining room. Here we all began to talk over the things that had been and that were to be. Now and again I could feel that one or other of us was forcing conversation, as if we were not sure of ourselves. The long wait was beginning to tell on our nerves. It was apparent to me that Mr. Trelawney had suffered in that strange trance more than we suspected, or than he cared to show. True, his will and his determination were as strong as ever, but the purely physical side of him had been weakened somewhat. It was indeed only natural that it should be. No man can go through a period of four days of absolute negation of life without being weakened by it somehow. As the hours crept by, the time passed more and more slowly. The other men seemed to get unconsciously a little drowsy. I wondered if, in the case of Mr. Trelawney and Mr. Corbeck, who had already been under the hypnotic influence of the Queen, the same dormance was manifesting itself. Dr. Winchester had periods of distraction which grew longer and more frequent as the time wore on. As to Margaret, the suspense told on her exceedingly, as might have been expected in the case of a woman. She grew paler and paler still, till at last, about midnight, I began to be seriously alarmed about her. I got her to come into the library with me and tried to make her lie down on a sofa for a little while. As Mr. Trelawney had decided that the experiment was to be made exactly at the seventh hour after sunset, it would be as nearly as possible three o'clock in the morning when the great trial should be made. Even allowing a whole hour for the final preparations, we had still two hours of waiting to go through, and I promised faithfully to watch her and to wake her at any time she might name. She would not hear of it, however. She thanked me sweetly and smiled at me as she did so, but she assured me that she was not sleepy and that she was quite able to bear up, that it was only the suspense and excitement of waiting that made her pale. I agreed perforce, but I kept her talking of many things in the library for more than an hour, so that at last, when she insisted on going back to her father's room, I felt that I had at least done something to help her pass the time. We found the three men sitting patiently in silence. With manlike fortitude they were content to be still when they felt they had done all in their power and so we waited. The striking of two o'clock seemed to freshen us all up. Whatever shadows had been settling over us during the long hours preceding seemed to lift at once, and we went about our separate duties alert and with alacrity. We looked first to the windows to see that they were closed, 
and we got ready our respirators to put them on when the time should be close at hand. We had from the first arranged to use them, for we did not know whether some noxious fume might not come from the magic coffer when it should be opened. Somehow it never seemed to occur to any of us that there was any doubt as to its opening. Then, under Margaret's guidance, we carried the mummied body of Queen Terra from her room into her father's and laid it on a couch. We put the sheet lightly over it so that if she should wake she could at once slip from under it. The severed hand was placed in its true position on her breast, and under it the jewel of seven stars which Mr. Trelawney had taken from the great safe. It seemed to flash and blaze as he put it in its place. It was a strange sight and a strange experience. The group of grave, silent men carried the white, still figure, which looked like an ivory statue, when through our moving the sheet fell back, away from the lighted candles and the white flowers. We placed it on the couch in that other room, where the blaze of the electric lights shone on the great sarcophagus fixed in the middle of the room, ready for the final experiment, the great experiment consequent on the researches during a lifetime of these two traveled scholars. Again, the startling likeness between Margaret and the mummy, intensified by her own extraordinary pallor, heightened the strangeness of it all. When all was finally fixed, three-quarters of an hour had gone, for we were deliberate in all our doings. Margaret beckoned me, and I went out with her to bring in Silvio. He came to her, purring. She took him up and handed him to me, and then did a thing which moved me strangely and brought home to me keenly the desperate nature of the enterprise on which we were embarked. One by one, she blew out the candles carefully and placed them back in their usual places. When she had finished, she said to me, "'They are done with now. Whatever comes, life or death, there will be no purpose in their using now.' Then, taking Silvio into her arms and pressing him close to her bosom where he purred loudly, we went back to the room. I closed the door carefully behind me, feeling as I did so a strange thrill as of finality. There was to be no going back now. Then we put on our respirators and took our places as had been arranged. I was to stand by the taps of the electric lights beside the door, ready to turn them off or on, as Mr. Trelawney should direct. Dr. Winchester was to stand behind the couch, so that he should not be between the mummy and the sarcophagus. He was to watch carefully what should take place with regard to the queen. Margaret was to be beside him. She held Silvio ready to place him upon the couch or beside it when she might think right. Mr. Trelawney and Mr. Corbeck were to attend to the lighting of the lamps. When the hands of the clock were close to the hour, they stood ready with their linstocks. The striking of the silver bell on the clock seemed to smite on our hearts like a knell of doom. One. Two. Three. Before the third stroke, the wicks of the lamps had caught, and I had turned out the electric light. In the dimness of the struggling lamps, and after the bright glow of the electric light, the room and all within it took weird shapes, and all seemed in an instant to change. We waited with our hearts beating. I know mine did, and I fancied I could hear the pulsation of the others. The seconds seemed to pass with leaden wings. It were as though all the world were standing still. The figures of the others stood out dimly, Margaret's white dress alone showing clearly in the gloom. 
the thick respirators which we all wore added to the strange appearance. The thin light of the lamps showed Mr. Trelawney's square jaw and strong mouth and the brown shaven face of Mr. Corbeck. Their eyes seemed to glare in the light. Across the room Dr. Winchester's eyes twinkled like stars and Margaret's blazed like black suns. Silvio's eyes were like emeralds. Would the lamps never burn up? It was only a few seconds in all till they did blaze up. A slow, steady light, growing more and more bright, and changing in color from blue to crystal white. So they stayed for a couple of minutes without change in the coffer, till at last there began to appear all over it a delicate glow. This grew and grew till it became like a blazing jewel, and then like a living thing whose essence of life was light. We waited and waited, our hearts seeming to stand still. All at once there was a sound like a tiny muffled explosion, and the cover lifted right up on a level plane a few inches. There was no mistaking anything now, for the whole room was full of a blaze of light. Then the cover, staying fast at one side, rose slowly up on the other, as though yielding to some pressure of balance. The coffer still continued to glow, from it began to steal a faint greenish smoke. I could not smell it fully on account of the respirator, but even through that I was conscious of a strange, pungent odor. Then this smoke began to grow thicker, and to roll out in volumes of ever-increasing density till the whole room began to get obscure. I had a terrible desire to rush over to Margaret, whom I saw through the smoke still standing erect behind the couch. Then, as I looked, I saw Dr. Winchester sink down. He was not unconscious, for he waved his hand back and forward, as though to forbid anyone to come to him. At this time the figures of Mr. Trelawney and Mr. Corbeck were becoming indistinct in the smoke, which rolled round them in thick, billowy clouds. Finally I lost sight of them altogether. The coffer still continued to glow, but the lamps began to grow dim. At first I thought that their light was being overpowered by the thick black smoke, but presently I saw that they were, one by one, burning out. They must have burned quickly to produce such fierce and vivid flames. I waited and waited, expecting every instant to hear the command to turn up the light, but none came. I waited still and looked with harrowing intensity at the rolling billows of smoke still pouring out of the glowing casket, whilst the lamps sank down and went out one by one. Finally there was but one lamp alight, and that was dimly blue and flickering. The only effect of light in the room was from the glowing casket. I kept my eyes fixed toward Margaret. It was for her now that all my anxiety was claimed. I could just see her white frock beyond the still white shrouded figure on the couch. Silvio was troubled. His piteous meowing was the only sound in the room. Deeper and denser grew the black mist, and its pungency began to assail my nostrils as well as my eyes. Now the volume of smoke coming from the coffer seemed to lessen, and the smoke itself to be less dense. Across the room I saw something white move where the couch was. There were several movements. I could just catch the quick glint of white through the dense smoke in the fading light, for now the glow of the coffer began quickly to subside. I could still hear Silvio, but his meowing came from close under. A moment later I could feel him piteously crouching on my foot. 
Then the last spark of light disappeared, and through the Egyptian darkness I could see the faint line of white around the window blinds. I felt that the time had come to speak, so I pulled off my respirator and called out, "'Shall I turn up the light?' There was no answer, so before the thick smoke choked me, I called again, but more loudly, "'Mr. Trelawney, shall I turn up the light?' He did not answer, but from across the room I heard Margaret's voice, sounding as sweet and clear as a bell. "'Yes, Malcolm.' I turned the tap, and the lamps flashed out. But they were only dim points of light in the midst of that murky ball of smoke. In that thick atmosphere there was little possibility of illumination. I ran across to Margaret, guided by her white dress, and caught hold of her and held her hand. She recognized my anxiety and said at once, "'I am all right.' "'Thank God,' I said. "'How are the others? "'Quick, let us open all the windows and get rid of this smoke.' "'To my surprise, she answered in a sleepy way. "'They will be all right. "'They won't get any harm.' "'I did not stop to inquire how or on what ground she formed such an opinion, "'but threw up the lower sashes of all the windows and pulled down the upper.' Then I threw open the door. A few seconds made a perceptible change as the thick black smoke began to roll out of the windows. Then the lights began to grow into strength and I could see the room. All the men were overcome. Beside the couch, Dr. Winchester lay on his back as though he had sunk down and rolled over and on the farther side of the sarcophagus, where they had stood, lay Mr. Trelawney and Mr. Corbeck. It was a relief to me to see that, though they were unconscious, all three were breathing heavily as though in a stupor. Margaret still stood behind the couch. She seemed at first to be in a partially dazed condition, but every instant appeared to get more command of herself. She stepped forward and helped me to raise her father and drag him close to the window. Together we placed the others similarly, and she flew down to the dining room and returned with a decanter of brandy. This we proceeded to administer to them all in turn. It was not many minutes after we had opened the windows when all three were struggling back to consciousness. During this time my entire thoughts and efforts had been concentrated on their restoration, but now that this strain was off, I looked round the room to see what had been the effect of the experiment. The thick smoke had nearly cleared away, but the room was still misty and was full of a strange, pungent, acrid odor. The great sarcophagus was just as it had been. The coffer was open, and in it, scattered through certain divisions or partitions wrought in its own substance, was a scattering of black ashes. Over all, sarcophagus, coffer, and, indeed, all in the room, was a sort of black film of greasy soot. I went over to the couch. The white sheet still lay over part of it, but it had been thrown back as might be when one is stepping out of bed. But there was no sign of Queen Terra. I took Margaret by the hand and led her over. She reluctantly left her father to whom she was administering, but she came docilely enough. I whispered to her as I held her hand, "'What has become of the Queen? Tell me. You were close at hand and must have seen if anything happened.' She answered me very softly. There was nothing that I could see. Until the smoke grew too dense, I kept my eyes on the couch, but there was no change. Then, when all grew so dark that I could not see, I thought I heard a movement close to me. 
It might have been Dr. Winchester who had sunk down, overcome, but I could not be sure. I thought that it might be the Queen waking, so I put down poor Silvio. I did not see what became of him, but I felt as if he had deserted me when I heard him meowing over by the door. I hope he is not offended with me. As if in answer, Silvio came running into the room and reared himself against her dress, pulling it as though clamoring to be taken up. She stooped down and took him up and began to pet and comfort him. I went over and examined the couch and all around it most carefully. When Mr. Trelawney and Mr. Corbeck recovered sufficiently, which they did quickly, though Dr. Winchester took longer to come round, we went over it afresh. But all we could find was a sort of ridge of impalpable dust which gave out a strange, dead odor. On the couch lay the jewel of the disc and plumes which the queen had worn in her hair, and the star jewel which had words to command the gods. Other than this, we never got clue to what had happened. There was just one thing which confirmed our idea of the physical annihilation of the mummy. In the sarcophagus in the hall, where we had placed the mummy of the cat, was a small patch of similar dust. In the autumn, Margaret and I were married. On the occasion, she wore the mummy robe and zone and the jewel in which Queen Terra had worn in her hair. On her breast, set in a ring of gold made like a twisted lotus stalk, she wore the strange jewel of seven stars which held words to command the god of all the worlds. At the marriage, the sunlight streaming through the chancel windows fell on it, and it seemed to glow like a living thing. The graven words may have been of efficacy, for Margaret holds to them, and there is no other life in all the world so happy as my own. We often think of the great queen, and we talk of her freely. Once, when I said with a sigh that I was sorry she could not have waked into a new life in a new world, my wife, putting both her hands in mine and looking into my eyes with that faraway, eloquent, dreamy look which sometimes comes into her own, said lovingly, "'Do not grieve for her.' Who knows, but she may have found the joy she sought. Love and patience are all that make for happiness in this world, or in the world of the past or of the future, of the living or the dead. She dreamed her dream, and that is all that any of us can ask. The End End of Chapter 19 Recording by Roger Moline End of The Jewel of Seven Stars by Bram Stoker